say, hold on. <laughs> Okay, guys, it's all yours. Alright. Um, I'm Philip Wardman, and we're going to do what? Well, oh, hold on. I'm Philip. Oh, I'm Philip Wardman. <laughs> Start over. I'm Philip Boardman, and I'm going to interview William, Dr. William Hauser. The camera will be controlled by Brian Beagle, and we're doing this for a oral history report for um, New York State. What the? Took a picture. Oh, wait, 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 wait. wait. Dr. Hauser, um, where did you, where were you born? I was born in Rome, New York. Did you go to school here? Yes, I did. Right. I graduated in 1941. Okay. And I had PG'd here to play football. Then the next year I went to Colgate. Did you graduate from Colgate before you joined the Army? No, no. As a matter of fact, I only stayed at Colgate about a half of a term. And uh, the coach, Andy Kerr, wanted me to play football, and he wanted me to join the Marines, and I knew I was going to go in the service, and I would rather try for pilot training. So I left and tried for pilot training. Okay. Um, so you volunteered then? Yes, that was 1942. Um, when you first joined the military, what was it like at boot camp, at training? I was at uh, Atlantic City, New Jersey. And uh, actually I was sworn in in Syracuse. And then because uh, they had so many recruits, they couldn't take people into training right away. And it was about February that I got to uh, 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 Atlantic City, and it sounds good, but we had to drill in the sand, and that was, it was kind of tough. Not bad, but you think of Atlantic City, a resort, it would be a great deal, you know, but it was typical Army. Um, what happened after that? I mean, did you... After that, uh, actually, uh, before I enlisted, I took an exam at the post office in Utica for pilot training. And I had passed the pilot training exam, or at least air crew training. And then uh, uh, we, everybody had to go to Army basic training, which I just said I went to Atlantic City. And that lasted about uh, two and a half or three months. And then we were supposed to go uh, to a, uh, actually start some sort of training t in aviation, but they had so many candidates lined up that they sent us to what they called college training detachment. And we went, I went to Williamsport, Pennsylvania to Dickinson Junior College. And there we uh, I got a little time in uh, Piper Cubs, flying Piper Cubs, and we took science courses and so forth. And we stayed there about uh, three months. Okay. Um, when you were shipped overseas, you were shipped to England, right? Yes, but there was a lot of stuff in between there, if you want to wow. hear it. Yes. <laughs> uh, from uh, uh, college training detachment, which, see, at this point, we were aviation, called aviation students. And we received quite rigorous training, like uh, West Point, like the uh, service academies. 
And from there, we went to uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and we became, after we got through the college training detachment, and we had to take a series of tests again to see if we would become a pilot, attempt to become a pilot, a bombardier, or a navigator. And I got the, I completed the pilot training, or the pilot testing. And then from there, we went to uh, Maxwell Field, Alabama for pre-flight. And that was six months, or three months of really tough training. My brother was uh, a block and a half from me and I couldn't go visit him for two of the three months. It was very rigid. And after that we went to primary flight school. And uh, at flight school we flew Stearman's. They're crop dusters now. They still use them for crop dusters. Are you interested in this? Is this interesting or important at all? Yes. Well, uh, there I learned, that's where we really first learned how to fly, learned, started learning how to fly. And uh, that last, I got 90 hours of flying in the Stearman. And then from there we went to basic flying training where we flew a Volte single engine aircraft at 450 horsepower engine. And uh, we learned to uh, fly a heavier airplane and a much faster airplane. And then from there, we went to advanced flying training. And we flew eight, I flew AT-10s, it was a two-engine aircraft. And then I graduated from cadets and became First I was a flight officer, and then a second lieutenant, and then a first lieutenant. And uh, I graduated from flying school there, May 23rd, 1944. It's a day I'll never forget. And then from that, uh, we went to uh, transitional training where we started flying uh, an operational aircraft. And I flew B-24s and uh, learned how to fly B-24s and uh, Laredo, Texas. And then after that, we went, I went to Walla Walla, Washington, where we uh, formed crews and got combat crew training in B-24s. Where's Walla Walla, Washington? It's uh, in the southern part of the state of Washington and towards the uh, Pacific Ocean. We, we weren't on the ocean, but we were like 50 or 100 miles from there. And we were very close to Northern California. And after we got training there, we were assigned aircraft at uh, San Francisco to fly to Honolulu and then to combat missions in South Pacific. And the last minute they canceled those plans uh, because they needed new crews in, a, in Europe. And we took a train across Europe and uh, uh, went to Camp Kilmer, <clears throat> uh, that's in New Jersey, on the ocean. And we went overseas on the Aquitania. So you took a train across the United States? Yes. Oh. And uh, where did you arrive in Europe? Pardon? Um, where did you arrive in Europe? In Europe, uh, uh, we landed uh, in uh, near Ireland and uh, on the west coast of England. And it was the day after Thanksgiving of 1944. And then we got on, I don't know if it was trucks or trains or probably both, and got to our group assignment which was the 490th Bomb Group uh, and the 2nd divi 3rd Division of the 8th Air Force. And uh, when we got there, all they had were B-17s. And we were shocked because we trained in B-24s. We got transitional training, which was very easy from one bomber to the other. But uh, uh, we missed bombing during the Battle of the Bulge, or during the critical part of the Bulge, because we were taking this transitional training. 
and my first combat mission was January 14, 1945. By that time, uh, we pretty much had control of the air. And uh, the missions, the people that flew the missions from 1942 to about 19, the fall of 1944, they had the roughest time flying. And at that time, their tour was 25 missions, and when I was there, it was 35. Um. So, can you tell me anything about your first time in, on a, a sortie over Germany? Well, uh, the most critical part was, it seemed to me, the most critical part was the assembly. Because uh, uh, there were 36 airplanes in a group, 12 in a squadron and we would mount thousand airplane rays. And the organization of climbing through the clouds and finding your lead ship was an endeavor. That would take a couple of hours, or at least an hour and a half. And uh, right off the bat, uh, we discovered that was the most dangerous part of the mission. Every day we would see two airplanes colliding and uh, two craft lost and crews lost. And uh, I can't go into the details of it, but this, that was the, the worst part of the mission, really, most of the time. And then uh, on the first mission, it was a perfectly clear day, and we went over the channel, and the people, the Germans, were shooting flag at us. and. Uh, I could see the red of the flag and I thought it was pretty. And I didn't realize that when it was that close that you could see the red, it was dangerous. <laughs> but uh, the mission was easy. We, came, we returned. All the airplanes returned. The first mission. Were there any missions that like, weren't so easy? I mean, like, I suppose there would be quite a few of them, but was there any in particular that you think of? Well, uh, it, was, it was always exciting. There was plenty, and being a pilot uh, or a co-pilot, you were busy flying the airplanes. The ones that had it most difficult were the tail gunner and the nose gunner. The nose gunner saw what was coming, the tail gunner saw what happened. You know, and, they, and, and the ball gunner, that was a... Uh, they, they deserve an awful lot of credit for the courage they had to fly in those positions. The radio operator was busy and the, and the crew chief, the air crew chief, was always busy doing something. But uh, the, uh, after we were assembled, the, they would call it a bomber stream, and we it was like driving down a road with all these airplanes ahead and behind. And uh, then when it came to getting to the target, you'd line up, you know, and each group would take their turn over the target. And, and on two or three occasions, uh, I would see the group in front of us uh, getting damaged, airplanes being shot down. Then we drop our bombs and nothing but stale flag. Then we'd turn down to head for home, and I'd look back, and the group behind us would be getting. Hit. And uh, what it was, the flag gunners had to cool their guns for a few minutes occasionally. And <laughs> it was just a matter of luck. Airmen, all airmen, became very superstitious. Everything you considered luck. And that was a perfect. That happened more than once. The uh, we had one mission where if if the group flew a very good formation, the enemy fighters would not pick on you. They'd look for a group that had loose or poor formation. And uh, our history, we only had one attack of aircraft, enemy aircraft, and. Uh, I was on the mission, 
and what happened after we dropped the bombs and made the turn for home, we ran through some wispy clouds and it disturbed our formation. And the ME-262s were there then, and they were pretty potent. And they shot down three of our lower airplanes and our lower squadron. And um, the, uh, the jet pilot, his airplane stalled right in front of us. And uh, the nose gunner was, I mean, he was so shocked he didn't shoot at him. But it was, it was about, only about 30 or 40 feet away. That was interesting. That wasn't too scary. Uh, there are a few other incidents. I don't know if you want to hear all this stuff or not. Sure, that's what we're here for. One time our bombs hung up. We had a load of 500 pound bombs and we attempted to drop our bombs at the uh, time that uh, we were supposed to and they got stuck in the bomb bay. And with our weight, we couldn't keep up with our group. We, this was over Berlin. And uh, Berlin really wasn't a very difficult target for the times that I went there. But uh, the uh, bombs hung up and we kept falling behind. And if you were a straggler, that's what, that was the most dangerous part. And uh, we shook the airplane, did everything, and sent the crew chief back and he tried to and then uh, all of a sudden over the northeast portion of Berlin all these bombs fell out. And uh, the ball gunner followed the bombs down and he said they demolished the whole block in northeastern uh, Berlin. So then we got back to our regular airspeed, but we had to drive or fly back to the uh, stream of bombers so we could join up with somebody. And we saw two fighter planes heading in our direction. And it turned out that they were P-51s. And they escorted us back. <laughs> that was nerve-wracking. Well, it was a little bit exciting. And uh, I don't know if this isn't history or anything, but this is a, a typical weird thing that happens. I, can, I, remember, I used to remember the date of that uh, mission. And when I got back to Colgate, my history teacher, his name was Dr. Rosen, my history uh, Spanish teacher, I think he taught Spanish, and uh, he was a German Jew, and he always wore a necktie, black necktie. And one day, for some reason, I asked him why he wore the black necktie, and he said he, was, he had escaped from Germany, but his wife, who wasn't a Jew, was still in Europe. And uh, towards the end of the war, she was working in a Red Cross center, and it was bombed, and she was killed. And I said, uh, what date was that? And he says, uh, told me the date. And then I said to him, I said, uh, oh, that was in the northeast section of Berlin, wasn't it? And he says, yes, when he said the address. Yes, and I never told him that I dropped those bombs that day on the northeast part of Berlin. But that's strange. But you'd hear stories like that that you couldn't put in a book. It would be too ridiculous, you know. And uh, one mission that I didn't get credit for, we dropped food to the Dutch. And I was breaking in a, a new crew. And the new crews always flew in the bottom part of the formation. And we were flying over towards Amsterdam and at about less than 500 feet. Well, probably the lead plane was up higher, but we were the bottom spot. And uh, flying over this harbor, and I looked up and there was a big crane in front of me. And we we missed it by inches. And then we went over this golf course 
and dropped all the bundles of food on the golf course and the people ran out and got it. But a truce was called by the Germans and us to the, the Dutch people were starving. Why didn't you get credit for that? Because it wasn't a combat mission. But I almost got killed. <laughs> but uh, I, 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 I didn't make an issue out of it. All I wanted to do was get home. Uh, we had to be very careful of our fuel. And in our first missions, see the pilot would fly, we flew formation, and the pilot would fly for 15 minutes and the co-pilot would fly for 15 minutes. And we had a mixture control that we were supposed to, as soon as you move the throttles, you're supposed to adjust the mixture. And this way you would conserve gas. And uh, this was a fairly short mission and we, we had flown a few, maybe 10 or 12 missions. And we thought, why fool around with that? When we got the 15 minutes off, let's relax most of it, you know. And uh, we got back to our base and it was weathered in. So we had to go to Northern Scotland. And we got, oh, three quarters of the way to the base and we had to contact our group leader and tell him we were running out of gas. We shot a red flare, got out of the formation, and on the downwind leg, we ran out of, I, I was switching the gas from the different engines. And the best thing was to have the outboard engines running. So I switched the gas from the inboard to the outboard engines, and they went out. And then we made the right angle, and then the final approach. And we landed on the, the runway, taxi to turn off. Before we got off the runway, the outboard engines went out. <laughs> that was unpleasant. <laughs> we all got hysterical. Any other interesting missions or experiences? Well, uh, right after the war, the day after the war ended, there was a lot of celebrating going on. And uh, I wasn't much of a drinker. I was almost a teetotaler. And my CEO came over to me and asked me if I would fly some newsmen around Europe that four or five hundred feet. This is the day after the war ended. And I said, sure, I thought that would be an interesting thing. And I did. And uh, uh, absolutely total destruction. In England, uh, different areas would be bombed out, but the, the city wasn't leveled. And all the cities in Germany, Munich, Cologne, Berlin, Frankfurt, leveled, leveled. And uh, when we came back, we buzzed the Eiffel Tower. Nobody would say anything to us the day after the war. And then we came home to the, our base. Also, uh, a mission after the war that was rather interesting. We went to, this was about a week after the war ended, we went to this uh, uh, Linz, Austria where the Germans had French POWs. And we picked up the POWs and took them to France, back to France. And they had been POWs for six years. And they were reluctant to get on the airplane. They didn't know if they wanted to or not. And then when they, they were still tense, you know, they were around the cockpit, some of them were. And uh, when they saw they were over France, they really celebrated. They were happy. We landed there. The missions were, we were trained and we had very good training. We were prepared and well trained for the missions. And uh, uh, if somebody was taken off the street and asked to fly on a mission, it would be kind of hard for him. Occasionally we'd have a chaplain or somebody like we had, Our ground crew chief wanted to fly a mission, so he did. But uh, uh, you were conditioned to put up with this, most of this. And we were prepared or tried to be prepared for any emergency. 
We had, uh, one time we came back from mission with 144 holes in our airplane, but it flew. That was the beauty of the B-17. Historically, I don't know if there's too much else to say except that I had great leaders. Our group commander was Colonel Frank P. Bostrom, and he's the uh, fellow who flew MacArthur out of the Philippines when we lost the Philippines. And uh, uh, squadron commander was an outstanding pilot and leader. When you felt confident in your leaders, you know, it, it helped a lot. Uh, <clears throat> on the way home, after the war ended, uh, they decided that we would each airplane would take 10 passengers. So 10 of the past anybody that they had that wanted to go would go with our crew of 10. And we flew to northern Scotland and landed. And then we flew to Reykjavik, Iceland and landed, which was very interesting. And then when we started on our last leg from uh, uh, Iceland to Goose Bay, Canada, that's in Labrador, Canada. Uh, we ran into icing, and we had de-icers on the airplane, uh, but the icing was pretty severe, and we couldn't go above the rain because rain and ice, because uh, we didn't have oxygen for everybody. We just had oxygen for the crew and not for the passengers. So we kept lowering down and lowering down. Finally, we got to 1,100 feet. And uh, it was in June, but there were icebergs here right opposite Greenland. And uh, there was a storm, and it was, you could see waves, big waves. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw all four oil pressure gauges go down to zero. And that meant I had 30 seconds of power. <laughs> and, oh boy, 30 seconds I died. And it turned out to be a, an instrument failure, not, an, not a mechanical failure. <laughs> and, and of course the thought was, geez, I completed all it. We lost a lot of pilots in training, too. And uh, I thought of all this, all the flying, and I had quite a few hours of flying. I had a four-engine commercial license with an instrument license. And all this, and now we'd never survive in that water. But it was instant failure. We did lose one airplane on, uh, out of the whole bunch of us, probably a couple hundred that flew back that way. But uh, I don't know, what else would you like to know? Um, those 144 Pardon? holes, the, the 144 holes in the airplane? Yeah. Was that from a dogfight or? No, that was from flak. Uh, we only had uh, one uh, aircraft attack, enemy aircraft attack. And that was uh, right at the end when they had the 262s. And they would, uh, uh, actually I saw quite a few of them on other missions, but we would lumber along at 155 miles an hour and they would go, they'd their cruising speed was well over 300, and they could go over 400. I remember my tail gunner saying, there's some fighters lining up on you, on us, get ready. And as it turned out, uh, P-51s got on their tail, and they had to slow down so much in order to make a pass at us that they just Gunned it and left. They didn't shoot at us. I saw the ME 163, which was a rocket type airplane. And that was uh, a, a plane, a small airplane, that, that would have enough power and enough ammunition to go up and make one pass at the bombers. And then it would glide down and land in a field. It looked like a bat. And, uh, when they would slow down, the 51s would shoot them, shoot them down more. 
that the, that was an unsuccessful thing they had. If the if the uh, Me 262s would slow down, they could probably get it. And I did see a P38 feather an engine, and a, and a German fighter plane started to make a pass on him. He turned around and shot the the fellow down. Actually. The German Air Force suffered through six years of flying. And at the beginning of the war, they had the best pilots going. They were called Goring's Yellow Noses. It's, it's airplanes had a yellow nose on it. And uh, they were very well trained, and hardly anybody could survive six years of uh, flying combat in those conditions. A few did. But by the time we got there, in 19, late 1944, uh, the attrition, I'm sure, had affected. They had the airplanes and they had, uh, they didn't have oil. Oil is what they didn't have. But they had as many airplanes at the end of war as they did any time. But the pilots and the gas. The, uh, as I told you, Art, look how long our pilot training was. It started in 1942, and we didn't graduate till 44 of May, and then we went through combat crew training after that. And these fellas, I mean, uh, Germany at this point, uh, if there was a, a training group down there, I'm sure the 51s would try to shoot them down. After all, they were going to be enemies if they weren't. And uh, I was on the mission to Dresden. Have you heard about that mission? Um, I think so, inside this book. What happened there? I, got a, I was on the mission here and I got it in the book. But that doesn't make any difference. I, I can tell you, we, uh, we prided ourselves on having this tight formation. We flew a real close formation so an airplane couldn't fly between us. And uh, this mission, we were supposed to go to Merseburg, which was the most difficult mission at the time. That's where they had the synthetic oil factories. And our mission, we were supposed to be the first group over and we had 100 pound anti-personnel bombs. And uh, actually, I had been to Merseburg one other time, and when we went over there, you'd fly right over Dresden. That's where you would turn over Dresden to head north towards the target. And uh, the target was maybe 15 minutes or 20 minutes or 30 minutes away, something like that. I don't know the exact. And uh, there was a complete undercast, a low undercast. And, uh, Every time a German fighter tried to come up, there was a 51 there ready to chase him down. So we had absolutely no combat, enemy combat aircraft around. And our group leader said, we've changed our mission. We're going to go to Dresden. And the target is the post office in the middle of Dresden. I, maybe I found that out after the, in the debriefing. But he said, spread out as far as you can. So we spread out as far as we could. Then he said, set your intervalometer settings so the bombs drop out slowly, not in a cluster, but they'd be scattered over a large area. And uh, as I said, many times we flew over Dresden, which didn't have too many targets. but. At this time, the uh, Germans were, or the Russians were getting pretty close to Germany. And I understand that Churchill wanted this uh, terror attack to get the German people to tell Hitler, we want to quit. You know. Well, they, they couldn't do that. Uh, anyways, after this mission, Hitler ordered all the airmen in captivity shot. But anyways, we dropped these anti-personnel bombs. And here there, there are refugees from the east pouring into Dresden. And then we're, we're spreading out an area of three or four or five football fields 
wide and a half a mile long over the center of the city. Then after that came the 500 pound bombs and the 1,000 pound bombs and then the 1,000 uh, pound delayed fuse. They had bombs that would go down in the cellar and then 12 hours later blow up. And then after that the British came over and they always dropped incendiary bombs. And uh, Hitler said that 300,000 civilians were killed. And that's what I have in my notes that I read. But I've heard since that it wasn't that many, but it was a lot. That was a bad mission. Did you know any Allied pilots and crews that um, lived through six years of war? I knew a German pilot that did. He was a, a, a flight instructor in Breckenridge, where I, where I went. My daughter Gretchen lives in Breckenridge. And I went there. We we chatted briefly, but uh, he he was a fighter pilot in the German Air Force, the Luftwaffe. Uh, I met when I'd go to London. Uh, we'd go on past to London. We'd have these big uh, the big huge officers' clubs, the dining rooms, and social things. We didn't want to talk about fighting then, and I'd met a lot of them. As a matter of fact, uh, I don't know, are we, are we, am I taking too much time here? No. One of the most, lots of funny things and weird things happen. And uh, every, all of the uh, colony soldiers disliked the English very much. And frequently we would be in a crowd where there'd be a mixture of different type of airmen and uh, very frequently the Canadian or the Aussie would pick a fight with the Englishman and there'd be a hell of a battle, you know, fist fight. And I went to this dance and geez, I saw these, this Canadian guy and this uh, English guy walking in the place. The mu music starts, those two guys get up and dance together. <laughs> We remember funny things like that. I had great bunk mates. Great bunk mates. The camaraderie was great, and uh, usually the the leaders. And as a matter of fact, in our in our uh, uh, barracks, there were twelve of us. We only lost one guy. Flag hit him in the neck. But uh, we don't want to get into that stuff. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, while you were in England, did anything really else happen that was interesting? Or did any other German planes or anything? Yes, yes there were. Um, uh, the, button, the V1 was the buzz bar. Mm -hmm. I saw a lot of those things flying over. And uh, uh, it would, when the motor would cut, everybody would duck. And then they learned, the Germans found out, and so they had it so the motor would keep running. But the, the things were not guided. You know, today our, mission, our missiles and things are guided into the target. And then they weren't. They were meant to be terror weapons, and they wanted them in the cities. And here we were in East Anglia with a bomber group. See, you know, there are 36 airplanes in a group, and if we put up a thousand planes, that, mean, that meant that there were 36 or 38 air, air bases all within a few miles, you know, like 15 to 20 miles from one another, maybe 30. But uh, anyways, we, we all got along. When I went back for a 50 reunion, 50 year, there were a lot of men there that were in their 50s and 60s, and they were little kids when we were there. They, they just loved to see us, and they treated us like we were celebrities. The, that was in 1992. The, the uh, 8th Air Force had been there 50 years from that time, or it's a 50 year reunion. 
the uh, uh, V1s, we used to see them being uh, shot off from Pinamundi. That was just across the channel. And uh, I went to London on a leave one time and I heard this explosion and I, there's an English man walking there and I says, what was that? He said, it's a V2 yank. I says, can't you hear him coming? He says, no. I turned around and went back to the base. <laughs> My friend stayed and he came back uh, unhurt, but he was all scratched up with frying glass. But uh, we did have, a, every now and then, Charlie, I think we call him, a German airplane would fly around. Just to, I, you almost, I don't know if anybody tried to shoot it down, it didn't seem. He was harmless, but uh, one evening, I was playing cards. No, one evening I had to go to the channel. And I went by this one uh, barracks, and people didn't put on their uh, curtains for a blackout. I said, don't you know there's a red warning out there? There's an airplane. And they were too busy playing their poker game. And after I went to the john, and I came out, and I put my comb on the corrugated metal, and I ran across the <laughs> the barracks with that sounded like machine gun bullets. <laughs> and the poker game was thrown up and everybody was mad and I never told them who did it. <laughs> Things like that were going on. It was a lot of fun. Um, what happened once the war, was? this was all when the war was going on. Yes. But what was it like just after the war ended? Oh, celebrations. Total celebrations. And, and uh, there was a tragic point. Uh, uh, what we did is uh, everybody did a lot of drinking. And uh, actually, as I said, I didn't drink much, but I drank some then for sure. And uh, somebody wanted to have some fireworks. We thought, well, let's go out and get the flare guns on the airplane. So everybody went and got their flare guns out and we had a whole box of flares because we would shoot them off when we were assembling. Uh, so we would know who to assemble with and the flares would be different colors. Well anyways, uh, we got these flares and we were shooting them around and having fun and, and we were only 22 at the time. You know? and, uh, uh, and then there was this guy riding by. Uh, from another, see, we had four squad, three squadrons. From another, and we shot the flare at him and went over his head, and that was funny. And then later on, somebody shot a flare and it landed inside this guy's blouse, and he almost died. So we quit doing that. But everybody celebrated, and if you were on the base, you had to stay on. If you were off the base, you had to stay off. You no traveling for about three days after the war. So I couldn't see the English, we didn't see the English people celebrating, just the base. Mm -hmm. um, so when you got back to the United States, how was it? Well, we, we landed at, uh, uh, gee, I can't think of the name of the field in Massachusetts. Boy, we were happy. And then we all had a 30-day leave. And the war was still on in, uh, in uh, the Far East with Japan. My brother was a navigator on a B-29. And I had another brother that was a navigator on a B-17. He was a lead navigator. But uh, we had 30 days leave and then we had to go down to Florida. And we were, uh, I flew a B-29 briefly, just four hours. And then uh, the war ended, so we came home. And uh, I, I, I was still on the active, I, what you did, you had terminal leave, and all the leave that you didn't get for the times, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, in disposed in con combat when you couldn't go on leave. And I went back to Colgate, and for the first month I was still on active duty. I started there in September of 45. Back. 
and everybody was happy and the students, the, the, all of the GIs that went to the school on the GI Bill were older and more mature and great students, good students. Um, what do you think you took back from the war most of all? Do you know what I mean? Well, the, the, the greatest thing that happened to me, when, as I look back on it, aviation cadets taught me how to study. When I was in high school, I was very interested in sports. I played football and basketball. and I was interested in passing, 80 average, 82 average, or something like that. And uh, when, when you're going through aviation cadets, you better pay attention because it might mean your life. You know, we lost cadets at every level. And uh, so I became an awful good student and I learned how to study. And when I came back to Colgate, I had excellent marks. And that allowed me to get into dental school comfortably. Uh, patience, taught me patience. And uh, football taught me never to quit. And uh, fortunately, and there was a lot of luck involved in getting through because of the 100 people that took that exam at the post office, about 20 or 20, 20 or 15 or 20 graduates finally got through the whole thing. Along the way, some people would decide they would either have poor uh, color vision or poor depth perception or uh, upset stomachs, you know, they just couldn't fly. So they'd drop off and then at primary flight, 60% would fail there and about 20%. So it was, it was luck to get through. Appreciation of life. I don't know what else. Um. I did go back in the service as a dentist in the senior year of dental school. I signed up on the senior dental student program in the Air Force. And I was stationed at uh, Pope Field uh, for two years as a dentist. I, I was thinking about getting on flying status because I would make extra money for it. But then uh, there was one other fellow in the whole dental Air Corps. That was the Air Force then, before it was the Air Corps. And uh, he signed up to, he was a dentist who did the same thing that I did. And uh, they gave him a Piper Cub and a field kit and sent him to Korea. <laughs> So I decided I'd rather have my duty in the U.S. and I didn't sign up for the flight business. Um, is there anything else you can think of in your experiences in the Army or the Army Air Force? Well, I made great friends and I was lucky where I got set, uh, sent in the dental corps. And uh, you can get sent to great, huge bases where you're, you're, you're a dentist and you just do one thing for two years, you know, and that isn't the practice of dentistry. And <clears throat> uh, also, I had been there about six or seven months, but, but we did rotate quite a bit. But then uh, uh, the base dental surgeon, who was, at this time I was a captain, at the base dental surgeon, he, they were always taking courses and he wanted to go take a course, I think, oral surgery someplace. So they needed the base dental surgeon for a year. And uh, because I'd had a military experience, I knew how to write a military letter, correspondence, and a few things like that, they made me the base dental surgeon. Not because of my dental ability, but because of my military ability. And uh, so I could arrange the schedules. and. I would get all of them together and say, well, who wants to do what, when? And we all helped each other. It was uh, like school, you know, like a camaraderie. And uh, uh, I gained an awful lot of dental experience there probably than most people did. All of these dentists had been in practice for at least two or three years before they were drafted. 
I wouldn't have been drafted, but I wanted to do this to get experience. The, uh, the Air Force treated me very nicely. Uh, the time in the service sometimes seemed to go awfully slow, but as you look back on it, it went very fast. I guess that's it. Huh? Right. Anything else? I'll try to answer anything you want to ask me. Um. The British flew at night. We always flew daylight. Uh, actually, flying an airplane at night in, on a clear day was very easy. If you could see the horizon mm -hmm. properly. In landing an airplane at night, was quite easy because you had the lights to help you judge, you know, your distance, like from yards to feet, you know, to the right down. Were there more losses during the day, though? There was in the beginning. In the beginning, and, and uh, if if uh, actually we just gained control of the air. The 50 runs were, and then when we finally had, they had the gas tanks so they could fly the whole, the whole mission with us. There was a long time when they would only fly halfway, and then the German fighter planes would be waiting on the other side. And uh, the, uh, by the time I got there, it was complete control of the air, and we had fighter attacks. You would see dog fights, and we'd see. Uh, the the 100th bomb group had uh, a jinx on them, they said. And what happened was that uh, a B-17 was uh, disabled, couldn't fly, they, was losing out, they were losing altitude. Uh, but they still had three engines and uh, their wheels fell down. Well, when the wheels came down, that meant that you were surrendering. And this German, probably old timer, one that was very well thought of, flew along next to him to guide him to a place to sand, uh, land. Well, the gunners on the B-17 shot that person down. And this was the 100th bomb group. And so, I can see it as plain as day. Everybody's flying along, and there's a the 100th bomb group with a perfect formation, and the fighters would go after that. And they said it was because of that mistaken deal in the uh, mission. Uh, there were all kinds of, I mean, uh, we had an awful good ground crew chief. I didn't drink, and I gave him my quart of whiskey then every time I got one. And he took awful good care of us. And when he found out, or when he asked to go on a mission with us, that made me feel good because he knew the airplane was in good shape. Every time we flew, we were supposed to walk around. We made a walk around inspection, but all we were looking for were loose things. You know. And quite a few airplanes would have to abort when they got engine or some mechanical failure. That's how engines got there. But the biggest thing and the thing that lost cost us more airplanes than anything were the mid air collisions. And that's what sort of cured me on flying. All my life to that point all I ever wanted to do was be a pilot. And uh, then realizing that uh, as a commercial pilot you wouldn't have a home I was a homebody, you would be on the move all the time. And uh, you always have the weather. Did you continue to fly after you left? That, you the only fly? time I flew afterwards was uh, I knew the general of the 8th Air Force, of the, uh, at the 8th Air Force, who was the 7th or 15th Air Force, I can't remember which one it was, uh, and when I was at uh, Pope Field. And he had a plush line B-17. 
and I did some dentistry for him and his wife, and so that's how I became acquainted with him. And uh, he knew I was from Rome, New York, and there were some maneuvers going on at, between Griffiths and uh, Camp Drum. He says, you want to ride up home? And I said, sure. So I went up and, and uh, he, I flew the airplane. Stick time. I really didn't land it or do any maneuver or anything. Just stick time. That's the only flying I've done since 1945. So you've never flown any planes since then? No. As a matter of fact, the first few times that I flew again, I don't want to talk too long here. I, I flew on a commercial airline and I got sick. See, you know, air sick. And I think it was because I couldn't have my hands on the controls. <laughs> but I got over that. Thank you very much. Well, you're welcome. I don't see hardly anything historical about this thing, except uh, I didn't know that. Turn it off.